Well, lovely to see you all um, on this last Sunday of 2023. What a privilege it is to be able to speak to you today with what the Lord has given me and laid on my heart. We're going to start with our reading, which comes from the book of Zechariah, which is towards the end of the Old Testament, if you are not familiar with it, one of the Old Testament prophets. And we're going to be reading chapter four. Chapter four of Zechariah. The gold lampstand and the two olive trees. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me. As a man is wakened from his sleep, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it and seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the earth. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold light, two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Well, many Christians will know the verse that I've chosen as our keynote verse today. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Many Christians know that verse, but perhaps they don't know where it comes from or into which context it was written. The book of Zechariah is one of the 12 books of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. They were called minor, not because they were less important than the other big prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, but they were just as important. They weren't minor in importance. They all packed a mighty punch. And the book of Zechariah is no exception to that. So let's look at the context that Zechariah was writing. The opening verse of Zechariah in chapter one tells us that the word of the Lord came to him in the eighth month of the second year of Darius. That was a real stark reminder that although some of the exiles had returned from Babylon, they, they had disobeyed God, God's people, and God had sent them off into exile, and the land was completely devastated. But some of the exiles were returning. They were returning home to Judah. 
but it was a real reminder that they were still under the rule of the Persian Empire. Indeed, all around them, they could see the effects of the ruin and devastation and the evidence of destruction around them. Zechariah's name means God remembers. Now, names in the Bible are really, really important. And it was important that Zechariah had that name. He was a prophet, as we've said. He was also a priest. And he was actually born in Babylon during the 70-year exile. So he had never been in the land of Judah until he returned to Judah in the year 538 BC with some of the other exiles. They had this wonderful name guy called Zerubbabel. He was the governor of Judah. And Joshua, not that Joshua, the, the walls fell down, but Joshua, who was the high priest, and they had returned to Judah to find it devastated. They'd already made a good start under Nehemiah and Ezra. They'd rebuilt the walls and they were laying the foundations of the temple. They'd even built the altar and, and um, consecrated it to the Lord. But they were beginning to lose heart. They needed further encouragement. They needed to continue the good work that they had begun. And they were very distracted and dismayed by opposition from within their own number and from without. They were distracted by their own personal needs. They were building houses for themselves and getting settled. And they were being put off completing the work that God had given them to do. So Zechariah and the prophet Haggai, they'd been sent to really encourage the people to continue with the good books, with the good works that they'd been doing. Haggai and Zechariah were contemporaries, they worked together and their books kind of belong together. So if you get a chance when you get home and you're interested, read Haggai as well. In Haggai chapter one and verse 13, it says, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began the work on the house of the Lord. So both Haggai and Zechariah were encouraging the people. But some of Zechariah's prophecies also looked further ahead, far into the future. And they are often apocalyptic in the same way as Daniel is. Some of the prophecies in Daniel and Ezekiel. And of course, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. So some of them were now, some of them were in the future. More than anything, the book of Zechariah shows us that although the people had come back to Judah, they were struggling against the odds, they were facing opposition and disappointment, still under the yoke of the Persian Empire, still not free, that God is in complete control. He's in control of the whole of history even when circumstances seem otherwise, with his help, they will complete the seemingly impossible task before them, rebuild the temple and restore the spiritual and the national life of the people. This really spoke to me and our situation here. And I hope you will find more out as we go further into this amazing chapter that we're looking at. Through a series of eight visions, God reveals his plans to Zechariah. We don't know whether he had all the visions, one after the other, um, in one time, or whether they were over a period of time, we're not really told. As I've said before, 
The visions concerned the situation that the people were in at that present time, and they also concerned the future, that God was going to bring his anointed one, his Messiah, and he would combine all the offices of prophet, priest, and king, and he would rule and reign forever and bring eternal blessings and peace and freedom for his people. How will he do this? How has he always done it? Well, it's our key note verse, isn't it? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The fourth vision that Zechariah focused, focused on was on Joshua, the high priest, being given clean new clothes and new robes before God. And therefore it enabled him to minister God's blessings and God's offices to the people. He had they, the people and he had a new standing before the Lord. This vision ended with references to the Messiah who would be God's chosen king and priest forever. But we're concerned today with the fifth vision in the chapter four that we've been looking at. It follows on from this by showing how those given a new standing before the Lord should work in his cause. So it's very, very relevant for us here today on the verge of 2024. He saw this vision, if Tim would like to put up this, the picture of the vision that he saw. There are also a few copies on the table as well. It's very, very strange. And Zechariah asks the questions about it several times. He patiently had a, um, an angel with him to interpret it for him. God gave Zechariah a picture of a solid gold lamp stand and it had a bowl at the top and it had seven lights in it, on it, and seven channels to the lights. On either side were two olive trees. The angel who was with Zechariah patiently helped him to understand what he was seeing. The image, therefore, is of oil constantly flowing into the bowl, through the pipes, through the olive trees, um, and into the channels and into the lights. Seven channels, seven lights, talks also about the seven eyes of God which roam throughout the land. The number seven in the Bible is a very significant number. It's the number of completeness. It's the number of God. It's his complete, utter control and the, his almighty power in total completeness. I wonder what the significance of olive oil is. Well, of course, it's been used for many purposes throughout history. It's used for cooking. It's used as a skin cleanser and a cosmetic. It's used in various medicinal compounds and also for lighting. It was very, very important in the anointing of kings and priests and to set them apart for a special service. I don't know if you saw the um, behind the scenes look at the coronation that was on in the week. It was very interesting, wasn't it? As they went through all the rituals and everything. Did you see that bit where they had to get the anointing oil that had to be flown in from the Holy Land, very, very special oil that was going to be used at the most sacred moment when the new sovereign is going to be anointed to serve the people and to serve God um, as King Charles III. So it's very, very special. Um, and it, yes, it was, it was flown in from, from the Holy Land to be used in the ceremony in this beautiful little silver little jug. It was just, just incredible, wasn't it? Really good. Oil is also a very powerful symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
In this vision, God's saying that by the power of the Holy Spirit, would the mountains be leveled, opposition be crushed, the temple completed, and the capstone. Now, the capstone was the last bit of the stone to go in to make the whole building and the whole of the doorway stand firm. And that capstone was going to be put in place amid shouts of joy and celebration. Against all the odds, the Holy Spirit was going to enable the people to do that. In verse 8, it says of chapter 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Zechariah. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord has sent me to you. So the glory goes to God, not by human effort and power and might will all this be accomplished. It will only be accomplished with the power of the Holy Spirit. So the glory will go to him. This has and always will be the way that God works. Throughout the Old Testament, we can see it, can't we, in the life of Abraham. The Bible said he was as good as dead when he received the promise that was given. His promised son, Isaac, was born. Moses started off so timid, he was even afraid to go before Pharaoh. And yet with God's power, he led the people through the Red Sea and into the Promised Land. Joshua, the other Joshua, the walls of Jericho fell before him before he'd even had to draw his sword through God's power. David was taken as a shepherd boy among the flocks to become one of the most powerful and Israel's greatest king. Elijah, who laid across the body of the widow's son and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the son received life again. The exiled people had returned through God's Holy Spirit and through his power against all the odds. We go into the New Testament. We've just talked about the Christmas story, the story of John the Baptist's miraculous birth and Jesus as well, his amazing miraculous birth, his death and his resurrection where the Holy Spirit raised him to life again. And the day of Pentecost, there were the disciples in the upper room, maybe a, still a bit frightened, maybe worried about the future. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke with other tongues and 3,000 people were added to the church on that one day. You see, the Bible isn't a catalogue of stories about superheroes who by their own might and power had conquered nations and changed the world. That's really what the world wants to hear, isn't it? Particularly at this time of the year, with the new year beginning, there's all these people who've written podcasts and books and written programs about how to, yes, you can do it this year. You can do anything. You can do anything you want to do. Well, no, you can't. They fail, don't they? Even our best resolutions fail. And even the conquering armies of the world, they failed. That all they can do is destroy things. From Alexander the Great through to Napoleon, Putin now, all these other guys, they just leave in rack and ruin. Where are they now? No, the Bible is about God working out his purposes in history through the lives of ordinary men and women like you and me. Yeah, I know. That's astounding, isn't it? But it's so the glory goes to him. So we can't say, I did it in my own strength. We're often frail and weak. No one knows that more than me. Whenever you know we're called upon to do something, we know, we realize our frailty and our humanness. We get things wrong often. But they were men and women who had surrendered their lives to him and allowed him to fill them with his Holy Spirit. It's about strength made perfect in weakness. Supremely 
demonstrated by Jesus. He gave up his life, he sacrificed his life on the cross. In everyone who looked on thought this is, this is supreme weakness. Why would someone die on a slave's cross in ignominy and shame? And yet the Holy Spirit was at work powerfully to raise him from the dead. He is alive forever. And through him, if we trust and believe in him, we have that gift of the Holy Spirit that gives us new birth and gives us power and might, not earthly power and might, and we can have eternal life forever with him. Well, what about these two olive trees that were each side of the lampstand? These are mentioned in verse 3 and in verse 12 to 14. In fact, Zechariah keeps asking the angel, you know, who they are and what they are. They're literally two sons of oil. One is Zerubbabel and one is Joshua, who are anointed and appointed by God to dispense the oil to his people. And in an amazing way, as we've already seen, they prefigure Jesus. He is our eternal high priest, our eternal king, and he will freely give of the Holy Spirit to his church, to those he loves and died for. All those that trust in him and believe in him can have the Holy Spirit. With God's help, we can change the world. We can see lives transformed and God's kingdom coming even here at this time. Well, what has it all got to do with us here at Eastgate? It's been a difficult couple of years, actually, hasn't it? And particularly tricky these last few weeks and months. We've had loss. We've had sadness. You know, in the, world's, in the world's eyes, we're very often derided and scorned and persecuted. When we look outside, people are going past without a care in the world. They don't give us any, any credence. But that beautiful gold lampstand in that vision shows us how precious we are to God, how much he loves us. We're worth more to him than the finest gold, than the most precious diamond in the crown. We are precious to him. He gave his life for us. And we are precious to him. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling downtrodden, remember, see him how God sees, see yourself as God sees you, precious in his sight. We've made a very good start here, haven't we? Like the returning exiles, we've begun to rebuild. We've changed to breakfast church, but it's been tough. There's been opposition and sadness and discouragement. And though we've, we have seen new people coming in and we praise God for every person who's come, especially our visitors from overseas, you've encouraged us and blessed us in our faith here. There's also been people that have gone out the back door as well, as well as coming in the front door. They've gone through the back door too. We're struggling at the moment with financial problems. We've got lack of people to fill all the key roles that we, we need to be filled. We've made a really, really good start with our Sunday school and our children's work, but we look at the need and we wonder how on earth it's all going to, going to be done. We feel, I don't know about you, I feel like some of the disciples. You remember they were out all night fishing, weren't they? They didn't catch a thing until Jesus came and told them to put the net down on the other side. We can feel exhausted. We've done this all before, Lord, and nothing seems to be happening. We feel like throwing in the towel. And how will we see all those needs met? How will we see people one and transform for Christ? How will we see the time when this baptismal pool will be open 
every week. Why not? Why not? How can we serve and serve our community and love Jesus as it says on our, on our leaflets? I believe very, very strongly that God is saying to us today, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. It doesn't mean that we have to do away with the day-to-day -day planning and the practical running of the church. That is all really, really important. We have to pay our bills and make sure our money is well um, ministered. We need to maintain our buildings. We need to do all those things. They are very important. But I think it does mean that one, we make God's word and the gospel our highest priority. We don't compromise, although it's very temp tempting to do that, to compromise with the world, to go along their path and to get tangled up in all of that. Therein lies disaster, really. That must be our top priority. It always has been in this church. And I pray that that will continue. We need to get serious about prayer. Personally, I'm speaking to myself and corporately. We're trying in this coming year to make opportunities for people to come and pray. You don't have to pray out loud, but you can be there. What an encouragement it is when people come and they're in an attitude of prayer. God hears our prayers whether they're spoken out loud or whether they are in our heart. Nothing will be accomplished without the Holy Spirit coming and ministering to us as we pray together and as we study God's word and take it seriously. I believe God is saying to us, don't make your decisions based on fear. We can so often be afraid. I'm sure those returning exiles were full of fear. How? How are we going to do this when there's so much that needs doing and so much opposition? We mustn't make decisions based on fear. Jesus says again and again, do not be afraid. I am with you. Remember Zechariah's name. God remembers. He hasn't forgotten us. He loves us. He wants us to grow and he wants us to thrive. And let's cry out to God for the Holy Spirit to come. We need revival. We need revival. But let's concentrate, as Paul said, on the greater gifts. The gifts that aren't perhaps quite so spectacular, but very, very necessary. Let's grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit love, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, gentleness, patience, goodness, faithfulness. Let's see that more and more worked out in our lives. You know, I think God's got a great sense of humor. He puts people together. We're all so different. We get up each other's noses. We irritate each other. And we think, oh, if only that person was more like me. We'd all be all right then. But no, that's God's way. That is so the glory goes to him. When we work things out patiently, kindly, and lovingly together, when we build each other up in, their, in our faith. Let's, let's go countercultural in this. Let's not go to, oh, well, things are bad. Let's all just huddle together and keep what we've got. Let's, as the Bible says, enlarge the place of our tent. There's room for more and more and more. Let's not shrink back in fear. So there's lots of challenges. But I want to say God wants to bless you today and encourage you and build you up. Paul wrote to the brothers and sisters at Philippi, but he could easily be writing to us here in Lewis on Sunday, the 31st of December, 2023. Paul wrote, in all my prayers for all of you, 
I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you and me in Eastgate Baptist Church, he will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ. So until Jesus returns, we work together, calling on the Holy Spirit's help. We can't do it in our own strength because God is faithful to his promise. He will complete the work that he has begun. And boy, I'm excited by that. It's blessed me so much doing this study. There's a little um, sheet on the table which has got a picture, the picture of the vision. And just a little question. Maybe we haven't got time today. I don't know. What do you think? Five minutes. Just what there's one question at the bottom. But if there's anything else you want to talk about between yourselves, then do about what difference it would make if we really took that promise, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If we really took that seriously in our own personal spiritual lives and in the life of the church. But do feel free, if you want to talk about something else, then just do, just for five minutes or so, even less probably. 